Today's episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast contains true stories of survivors of kidnappings, as well as those who were almost kidnapped. This video contains strong language, violent recollections, and mature themes that might be inappropriate for younger audiences. By continuing on with this video, you agree to listening to these details. Viewer and listener discretion is strongly advised. I'm writing this as a memoir of what happened while it's still fresh in my mind and to share it with all the amazing people here on our Let's Not Meet. I've been reading all of your stories for almost a year now and I feel like I should share my own story. I'll leave out some details for reasons you'll soon find out. This happened one year and two days ago. It was the day I never expected to come. It changed my life in so many ways that I feel like I still can't digest it. I want to start by saying a little bit about myself so you understand the context and why it was so weird and foreign for something like this to happen to me. I'm a fairly geeky guy. I love science fiction and video games. I worked at the time as a design engineer in a factory and spent most of my weekends with friends, hiking, playing board games or watching movies. So you realize nothing I did would attract the attention of the cartels. I don't have a lot of money. I just live in a lower middle class type of life here in Mexico. But the real issue was my sister, who has a high ranking position in the public security area of politics. That is the reason I was targeted. It was a Tuesday early morning. I was on my way to work which started at 6 a.m. I remember that day I took my dad's SUV. I have a small sedan because they were away on vacation and I was supposed to pick them up at the airport after work that day. I lived about half an hour away from my work, so I left at about 5.25 a.m. every single morning. When I was leaving, I saw a pretty shady SUV parked like a block away from my house. And honestly, after my sister took her job, I was more aware about things that I saw at a place. I felt a little bit paranoid because weeks before it happened, I felt like somebody was following me. So, yeah, I passed this SUV and saw a guy on the driver's seat with a baseball cap. I stopped for a bit, looked him straight in the eye, and he just looked down and covered his face. I honestly didn't think too much of it. My family had been telling me weeks prior that it was just overreacting and nobody was following me, so I thought it was just some random guy waiting for someone. I took off to work, and for me to get there, I have to go through a really shady neighborhood, which is poorly lit and has a really bad reputation. I was in a two-lane street that's only one way. I was in the right lane at the time and I saw a Jeep Cherokee just speed by me on the left lane and then continue its way in front of me. When we arrived at the end of the street, I had to turn right to get to work and the Cherokee just completely stopped on the right lane in front of me with her blinker signaling to the left. I found it kind of weird, but I didn't want to be an asshole and honk at them and wanted to give them a few seconds to move. While I was waiting, a frickin' explorer came screeching on the left lane. It stopped next to me, and four guys came out of it with guns, and one with a baseball bat. The guy with a bat smashed my window and hit me in the face, while another put a gun to my head and said, Esto es de verdad, pendejo. Bájate del carro. Which translates to, This is real, asshole. Get out of the car. So please understand that at this moment, I did not feel like they wanted to steal my car. I already knew they were trying to kidnap me. If I knew they just wanted the car, I would have given it to them. But I pieced everything together. The cars that I felt were following me at night every day. The guy just sitting in the SUV outside my place. And obviously, my sister's job. I knew that if they took me, it would be torture followed by certain death. And if they really wanted to kidnap me, they would not kill me. So I stepped on the gas. I smashed between the Cherokee and the Explorer and ran over one of the guys in the process. I sped as much as the SUV would allow me to and I honked so I could make a lot of noise and people would notice. 
and my hope was to get to my workplace, which had private security, and to call my sister so she could notify the police. With all the adrenaline in me, I passed the entrance to my work and tried to turn back, but I crashed in a corner. At that moment, I honestly felt like my heart would come out of my mouth. I took a breath and saw through my mirrors if they were following me, and I saw no one. An empty street that was already lit by the morning dusk. The SUV was still working, thank goodness. I turned around, got to my work, yelled at the security guards to open the doors, and I parked by the entrance, got out of the car, and called my sister. After that, I went inside and talked to my boss about what had just happened, and I went to the restroom to clean the glass and blood off my hair and my face. When I came out of the restroom and out to the parking lot, there were about 10 police cars outside my workplace. My sister had already told me to speak with a specific police officer and to confirm his name. Everything went smooth and I felt safe and protected. After that, I moved into my sister's house, which has a police guarding it. This, however, has cost me my job, my relationships, lifelong friendships, etc. Everyone's afraid to hang out with you when they know you're a target for the cartels, and it's totally understandable, but it does not make it feel any less terrible. Investigations continued throughout the beginning of 2017. I later found out through security camera footage that there were three SUVs in total with about 12 people trying to kidnap me. I found out that the cartel that was after me was one of the most powerful cartels in the entire world and that the person who was in charge of investigating my case was killed. So right now, I'm working for the Mexican government. It's a low profile job which does not pay much and does not attract too much attention. I've looked for ways to leave the country, but I don't have enough money or qualifications. I'm a college dropout. I'm still living with my sister, but with people protecting me and my family 24 hours a day, and the guys who try to kidnap me are still at large. I'm trying to make the best of this situation. I've lost a lot of weight. I spend more time with my nephews. And recently, I got into a steady relationship, although to be honest, I'm always on the edge, and I feel like I'm in imminent danger. So to the guys who try to kidnap me, let's not meet. Edit. Thank you guys for all your kind words and support. I honestly thought this would get buried. A lot of you are saying that this could bring more unwanted attention. And believe me when I say that a reddit post isn't going to change anything. People in my town know who I am and where I live. So yeah, don't worry you guys. I'm a girl. My mom was a horrible addict. She barely took care of me as a kid. At the time of this incident, I was around 6 or 7 years old. So my awareness and understanding of things happening may not exactly totally make much sense. This happened in the 90s. One night, my mother and I were on a car ride. I wasn't sure why we were driving, but it was late at night. I'm not sure what time it was, but I assume it was really late because there weren't many cars on the street and I was sleeping in the back seat. I don't even remember getting in the car but my mom drove up to some sketchy house and left me in the car for what felt like forever. Suddenly, the car door swung open, and someone violently grabbed me by my arm and yanked me out of the car. I started screaming and crying until the man that grabbed me looked me in my eyes and said, Be quiet and don't try to run, or I'll kill you. He had a scruffy beard and looked like a madman. I was scared to death. So, I ended up listening. He held me tight by my arm, shut the car door, and walked with me down the street. I looked back at the house my mom was in, hoping that my mom would come out the last second and save me. I looked at the house as long as I could as the man dragged me further and further away. As we walked down the street, I wanted to cry, but I was in shock and I was in fear. I didn't know what to do. If I sniffed or cried, the man would tighten his grip and yell at me. I can't even explain how scared and confused I was. 
We walked for a little while and ended up in the projects. The projects were a bunch of buildings crammed together in a really terrible neighborhood. We walked into one of the buildings and walked up a flight of stairs. My legs and feet hurt like hell, but I was too scared to stop moving or to complain. We walked up another flight of stairs when I saw some random guy smoking a cigarette in the stairway. Then without warning whatsoever, the guy that kidnapped me fell to the ground. I didn't know how the kidnapper fell to the ground so fast, but the next thing I remember is the cigarette guy was punching and kicking the kidnapper in his head and face. For the kidnapper was out cold. Cigarette guy picked up the kidnapper by the back of his jacket and threw him down the stairs. You have no idea how scary and violent it is to see an unconscious man fall down the stairs. To this day, I still have a fear of falling downstairs. He bled everywhere, and I still have no idea how cigarette guy knew to help me, but I'm so glad he did. Maybe he could see tears in my eyes. Maybe he just picked up on something and had a bad vibe, but he acted instantly. The first second he could, he attacked my would-be kidnapper. Cigarette guy starts pacing back and forth, swearing at himself, gritting his teeth, and clenching his fists. I thought he was mad at me, so I started to cry. He looked at me and said, Okay, 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 shut up, shut up. He had an attitude, so I listened to him out of fear. I wasn't as scared of cigarette guy as much as the bearded guy, but I was still in fear of him. He started to ask me questions with an attitude. Why are you out this late? Where are your parents? Why would you talk to strangers? I was in so much shock and confusion I couldn't answer the man's questions correctly. He asked if I knew my way home and I told him that I didn't. I told him a broken story about what happened and somehow with the information I gave him, he knew where my mom's car was. The only thing I remember about the road is passing a house with Christmas lights on, despite Christmas already being over. I think he knew the area well enough and figured out to where I needed to go from that information, but I honestly don't even remember telling him about the Christmas lights. Anyway, he told me that he would take me back if I promised over and over that I wouldn't tell the police that I saw him or anyone that looked like him and made me promise that I wouldn't even tell the police anything. He had an attitude, and I didn't care what he asked me. I just wanted to go back to my mom, so I agreed. I followed him down the stairs. The bearded guy was still laying on the ground bleeding at the bottom of the stairs, but the cigarette guy threw him down. He wasn't moving at all. For all I know, he was dead, and I hope now that he was. Cigarette guy stepped over the bearded guy and I followed him. We walked outside and cigarette guy looked around panicking. I remember him telling me, the police don't like me. We walked out of the projects and my feet still hurt. Cigarette guy was walking fast in a panic and I had to basically jog to keep up with him. I started crying and he asked what was wrong. I told him my feet hurt and I remember him sucking his teeth and picking me up with an attitude. He awkwardly cradled me in both arms. He walked me down the road for a moment, but then I remember him swearing and running behind a house or a building. A cop car was driving down the road. He put me down and told me to run to the police car. I tried to run, but my legs could barely move, and I was scared. The cop car kept driving and rode away without seeing me before I could even get remotely close to it. He kept swearing to himself as he picked me up again and ran down the street. He now took me behind a lot of homes and hid from every cop car that drove by. I assume now that the police were looking for me. He carried me in both arms, running fast down the road. When I saw my mom at her car in the distance, she was surrounded by police. Cigarette guy put me down and told me to run to the police. I got so excited the pain in my legs now disappeared. He put me down and then ran away. I ran towards the police and my mom picked me up and hugged me tight. The police started to ask me and my mom questions. Now, I don't remember too much about their questions, but I do remember my mom telling the police some story that just didn't make any sense. 
She basically told me not to say anything, and I didn't say much but cried a whole lot. We went home. Days later, my dad picked me up and I knew something was wrong. I told him everything. I never lived with my mom again. When I grew up and had time to think about that day, I never forgave my mother. And not too long ago, I asked my father what he remembers about the situation and he told me what he thinks happened from what I explained to him from years ago. He said my mom wasn't a drug binge. I got kidnapped. Someone saved me, but the person that saved me had warrants and wasn't mad at me whatsoever. He was just frustrated with the situation that he had to deal with. Imagine being a criminal on the run and now you have a kidnapped girl with you and you just beat a guy up half to death. If he would have gotten caught with me, he could be in jail for my kidnapping. With my mom lying and me being in shock and confused, I wouldn't be able to tell them that the man helped me because while it was all happening, I didn't even notice that he was helping. To the man that saved me, thanks. To the man that tried to kidnap me, let's not meet. Update. I think I found a cigarette guy. Somebody on Reddit knows a man with a similar story. I hope both people are the same. So far, it looks like it's the same man that saved me, but I'll keep everyone posted. Update number two. I need help. My update post was removed by the mods. I don't want to break any of the rules on here, so how do I keep everyone updated without getting my post removed? Update 3. I finally received confirmation. I found a cigarette guy. Died of the rules of the subreddit. I can't keep posting updates, so I'll post updates on my Reddit profile. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. In 2015, I was living in East Hollywood and I was working at a creative marketing agency as a project coordinator. The pressure of having to provide for my one-year-old son and his mother, combined with the grinding hours and travel of my job, had indeed begun to consume me. It felt as though the city was eating me from the inside out. One late afternoon, after work, standing in our bathroom, my chest began to cave in with pain. My girlfriend called 911 and an ambulance took me to the hospital. I was in the emergency room for the rest of the evening and into the night as they administered IV Ativan and I calmed down. Around 11.30 p.m., I was discharged. I called my girlfriend from the admissions desk, who had just gotten her son to go to sleep, which at times was a monumental task as he was abnormally colic in the first year. So I just told her that I was going to take an Uber, not realizing I didn't have my phone or any other personal belongings. Dazed and confused from the Ativan, I stumbled out onto Sunset Boulevard and started walking west toward my apartment, which was about a mile and a half from the hospital. As I was walking, a small early 90s model hatchback slowed to a crawl and began driving alongside me. The driver said something, but I couldn't make out a single word. The effects of the Ativan had drastically reduced my inhibitions, and I approached the car to hear what the stranger was trying to ask me. He said my name. Are you Max? You're Max. He had a thick Asian accent. Your name is Max. Matt? I treated you in the hospital. I'll help you. You get in. It's okay. He leaned over the center console and opened the door. I remember thinking that I'd never seen this person before, but somehow he knew my name. He knew I had just left the hospital and he was wearing scrubs. Additionally, this man was small and frail. He didn't feel like a threat whatsoever. And against what normally would have been my better judgment, I got into the passenger seat. But almost immediately, I regretted my decision to enter the vehicle. It was unkempt, not the car of a doctor, certainly. 
There were empty prescription bottles and takeout containers strewn about the floor of the car, and the ashtray was so stuffed with cigarette butts that the majority of them had fallen out onto the floors, and in between the cracks and crevices of the gear shifter, I noticed he was driving slower than he should have been, at least 10 miles under the speed limit. Suddenly, reality hit me. I was in an old, disgusting car with a strange man that I didn't even know, in the middle of the night, driving down a seemingly empty Sunset Boulevard in the middle of East Hollywood. With the sudden alarm bells going off inside my mind, I asked him to stop the car. I lived right around the corner, I told him, and I would like to get some fresh air before I got home for the night. The strange small man, however, didn't pull over. Sensing my fear, he reached over and placed his hand on the inside of my thigh, smiling. It's okay. You are here now. No one can help you. You help yourself now. You help me. I try to rationalize this strange statement. English clearly isn't his first language. This is Hollywood. This man sees young, desperate people every day working the streets. Manipulative, gross, and creepy. Yes, even dangerous, but I was not about to find out. By this time, the Ativan was no match for my fear and adrenaline, and so by instinct, I grabbed his wrist and threw it back at him. I ain't a trick. You touch me again, I'll touch you. Pull the car over now. As the car began to slow to a crawl, I thought about jumping out. I must have had my fingers wrapped around the door latch, because just then, I realized the door wouldn't open, and just as I was about to turn and demand again to be let out of this man's car, I realized that something was seriously wrong. When I turned my head to look at him, it felt as though I was experiencing deja vu, like I had already turned my head but I was in some sort of time loop. Suddenly, I'm staring down at myself from outside and above the car, and I could see everything. There I was, fully reclined in the passenger seat of this car as we fly down sunset, eyes wide open, with pupils the size of marbles. It was the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. I don't know if what I was seeing was fact or imagination, but my abductor had one hand on the wheel and the other seemed to be going through my left pocket as if he was frantically looking for something. I don't know how to explain the rest of this experience, but I have strong memories of coming back to reality under the fluorescent lighting of a gas station, finding myself staring at the door latch and unable to move. The next thing I know, I'm walking into a convenience store looking for a phone. I felt like a train had hit me and remember being so confused and embarrassed that I couldn't even articulate what had just happened. I didn't even know if 15 minutes had passed since I got into this man's car, or 6 hours. I didn't even know if anything had happened at all. Maybe I was in the middle of a psychotic break. As the sun came up, I realized that I was on the sunset strip. I remember looking down at my hospital band, and I remembered about the panic attack the emergency room. I remember the emergency doctor who treated me so kindly, and I remember the woman who had helped me call my girlfriend before I left. I also remember that small, frail Asian man who wore scrubs and called me by my name, who so selfishly offered me a ride home. I don't remember ever telling him where I lived, and he never asked. Additional Information I had an early afternoon appointment at Cedar sinai Heart Institute regarding my chest pains the actual day after this incident. Blood tests revealed ketamine, as well as a benzodiazepine called flubromazolum. It's important to note that I partied a lot and used a lot of substances back then, but I'd never done ketamine or heard of flubromazolum. My mom drove down to LA that day to be there for the echo appointment. I ended up leaving LA less than a week later with her. I now live in the Bay Area. Okay, so I've never told anyone this story before, but I figured this would be a good place to get it out of my system. This is one of the scariest nights of my life, and it still makes me scared to drive alone at night. 
but the only person in my real life who knows this story is one of my older brothers who was there after everything went down. So to preface this story, I'm currently a 21 year old female and I live in Ohio. At the time this story takes place, I was moving from a very well known suburb outside of a main city to a rural farming town with my family. My parents have never been the city type as they had both grown up on farms in the south during their childhoods and our whole family have lived in similar areas until I was about to enter high school so you can understand how itchy they were to get back to their roots. I am the youngest of four siblings. I have three older brothers and I was the last to finish required schooling. So the summer after I graduated from high school, my parents decided this was a good opportunity for a change in scenery because I was no longer tied down to a school district. The town that we were moving to was only around 45 minutes away and instead of moving everything all at once and to overwhelm ourselves with a full house of boxes, we were moving to a house about half the size of the one that we had been living in. My parents opted to have us move a chunk of our things every day for a few days for around two to three weeks in hopes that it would be easier for us to get settled into the new house. The majority of the drive between the two towns is through main highways and it's pretty much a straight shot, so I had become very used to the routine after a while. That's why this night was so terrifying, because I had literally made the drive nearly 50 times and I was so comfortable that my guard was let down completely. Now I'm a pretty small girl, around 5 foot 3 and about 140 pounds. And even though my dad taught me self-defense when I was younger, I'm the kind of person who freezes during confrontation or under pressure. Annoying, I know. So it's a miracle I made it out of this whole thing safely. This night I decided to visit some old friends of mine from the neighborhood that we were moving from. And because I was already down this street from my old house, I decided to stop on by on my way back to our new house so I could pack some things to take back with me. I can't exactly remember what time it was. I'm pretty sure it was around at 10 or 11 p.m. But regardless, it was already very dark outside. Now, even though Ohio is a northern state with pretty brutal winters, in recent years the summers have been basically sweltering, even at night. I can also get a little car sick in the heat with all the muggy air getting trapped in the car. And at the time, my AC was pretty terrible and never really worked right, so I usually drove with my windows down. As I said, it was pretty late, so there were really no other cars on the roads with me. I had maybe seen about 10 cars during the whole drive. When I made it a little over halfway on the second main highway I had to take, there was an intersection with a gas station on my right, and nothing but a river and a bridge on the left. It was a four-lane, two-way road and I'd happen to be in the rightmost lane because of a turn I had to make further up the road. This might seem like useless information now, but it will be important later. I hadn't instantly felt off in any way, because again, I had made the drive dozens of times. I pulled up to a red light at this intersection, and I was playing some pop punk music with my left arm out of my open driver's side window, so I could get some air outside of my hot car. I hadn't noticed it at first, but as I was waiting for the light to change, another car pulled up into the left lane next to me. Looking back now, I don't remember the make of the car. It might have been a Dodge Charger, but I do remember that it was a bright orange with a thick black stripe across the top of it. I was singing along to whatever song I had on at the time when I heard talking next to me. It wasn't so much that I had heard them specifically talking about me or anything like that, but they were talking quite loudly and I have ADHD, so the extra noises above the sound of my music made me turn my head. I regretted it immediately because when I looked to the source of the noise, I saw a man sticking his head out of the passenger side window, staring right at me and smiling widely. The look in his eyes made me want to throw up. Apparently, he had been talking to me, and I turned back quickly, knowing if I kept eye contact any longer, 
he would think that I was interested in chatting. Then I heard the sound of a hand hitting hollow metal. The guy in the car next to me was smacking his hand on the outside of his car, obviously trying to get my attention again. In the middle of all of this, the front passenger started to whistle. You know, that signature whistle that a lot of girls get while walking down the street. I started to get angry because I wasn't a dog, but I kept my gaze forward, praying for the light to change so I could get away from these creeps. Now, I know it sounds ridiculous that we are still sitting here at this red light, but the town that I had been passing through had really old and terrible light sensors, like the ones you have to back up and pull forward again to set off. And again, there had really been no one else on the road to set them off because there weren't even cars coming perpendicular to us either. I hadn't given them any indication I wanted to talk to them, but apparently, this gave them more incentive to continue trying to get me to look back at them. The front passenger and two other voices all piped up, saying things like, Hey baby, why don't you get out and hop in the car? We'll show you a good time tonight. Come on, pull over to the gas station. We're not going to hurt you. Why won't you talk to us? We just want to get to know you, beautiful. At that point, I'm shaking and had heard enough. So I roll up my window and lock the doors of my car. Well, this had apparently pissed the front passenger off, because before the window was up, I heard him shout, You bitch! before swinging his car door open. Before I knew it, he had gotten out of his car and walked over to the passenger door behind me, trying to pull it open and get inside my car. This is why the specifics of my location were so important. I was basically trapped because if I tried to get out to go run to the gas station, or, God forbid I had to run and cross the bridge on my left side, I would have to pass this car and the man outside mine to get there. Obviously, getting out of the car and running wouldn't be my best bet here, but at this point, I was so terrified I was trying to weigh out all my possible options. I know now would have been the best time to get the hell out of there, but I'm literally paralyzed in fear. Again, confrontation freaks me out and I can't even feel my feet to hit the gas and my hands were gripping the steering wheel so hard I couldn't feel them either. The man quickly realized he wouldn't be able to get in and walked up to my window, starting to smack a fully open palm on the glass. He was hitting it so hard that I actually thought I heard the glass creak a little bit like it was going to crack and break in. When I still wouldn't look over at him, he stopped hitting the glass just long enough to spit all over my window. I have no idea what gave me the strength. Maybe it was the fact that he was literally about to break the glass and get into my car, but right as he lifted his arm, and what looked like him about to elbow my window, I said, screw it, and hit the gas, running the red light and definitely exceeding the speed limit to get the hell out of there. I don't know what made me look back but when I glanced up at my rear view mirror, I saw that all three guys were now standing outside of the car. In one of their hands, I saw a small object, and to be quite honest, I don't even want to begin to think of what that might have been. I almost threw up from anxiety and pretty much cried the whole way home. My parents own a restaurant and are usually working late, so when I got home, my older brother was the only one there. He did his best to calm me down, but I don't think I slept at all that night. It's quite irrational because I know they hadn't followed me further than that light, but I even locked my bedroom door just to make me feel a little bit better. I regret not getting a license plate when I looked back, but as you can understand, I was so shaken up I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I've never had an encounter like that again in that area. But granted, I found an alternate route through the side streets, so I usually avoid that road altogether. Creepy ass dudes who try to kidnap me, I hope we never meet again. When I was 18, I was working at a movie theater near my home. The theater was located in a very rich area of my city. It was also like a midway to everything. So if people wanted to meet up, they would go there and then go on from there. It was my day off, 
I got a call from my friend, we will call her Alice, who worked in security in the area. Alice was heading down my way and wanted to see me during her lunch since I never really see her. It was late at night, maybe like around midnight when I got the call. I was up so I agreed to meet up. Alice suggested I hang out in the movie theater parking lot and she would meet me there, and I agreed. So I pulled up my car in the parking lot, parking facing the main road with shrubs in front of me. I wasn't worried about being there. I was told there was active security, 24 hours, and sometimes there's even police officers. But there's cameras too, and again this is a very wealthy area, and it's a good neighborhood. So I was sitting in my car texting on my phone waiting for my friend when I noticed a car pulling up behind me blocking me in from my side mirror. It was a large gray pedo van looking thing. I looked confused turning my head to see that they were diagonal behind my car making it completely impossible to back up or to get out by turning. I see the passenger roll down their window where there is a Hispanic man, thin not sure how tall, had a light mustache and messy black head. He's wearing a gray, maybe Nike sweater. I couldn't make out the driver. However, the passenger smiled and waved me to him. Come here, the man called waving me over. I shook my head no. Do I know you? I called. The man just kept smiling and waving me over. I definitely didn't know this guy. Come here. The man called again. No thank you. I called. I was obviously super creeped out. So I tried to start my car but they moved the van to press up against my bumper. Come here. The man called again, more annoyed. No. I called back. Go away. Come here. The man screamed through gritted teeth getting angrier and angrier, slamming his hand against the window ledge of the car. No. I yelled back in a panic. I looked to see if I could just drive over the shrubs, but it wasn't possible. It was a ledge, and the parking was slightly elevated. Then, I heard it. A very quiet sound on my back right car door handle clicking, like somebody was trying to open it. I looked back, seeing the angry man was still in the car, but the van's side door. It was open. Come here. The passenger in the car sang in a mocking, annoying tone when I looked back at the car. I looked out my right side mirror, seeing what looked like someone crouching against my tire. All I could make out was the slight view of white shoes in the dark, so I quickly moved to my locks making sure that they were locked. I was lucky my car automatically locked when I started driving. Come here, right now. I started crying in a panic attack as I heard the right passenger door handle being messed with. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared. I remember how white my knuckles were as I tried to think about how to get out of this. Right then my phone went off with a text message, reminding me it was even there to begin with. I grabbed for the phone and started to dial 911. I'm calling the cops, I screamed at them as I tried to get to the call button. I heard the man beside my right passenger door curse, bitch. He got up angrily hitting the window with his palms before bolting into the van and they sped out of the parking lot and quickly out to the main road and were gone. I was shaking and crying when they left. So I quickly got out of my car and ran to the security office close by. I should have driven but I was in shock and I was scared. I got to the security office panting sobbing and shaking. What's wrong? The security guard asked. I... I think I was almost kidnapped. I choked out. The cops on the property came over. I told them what happened. They blew me off. They must have recognized you from the theater and wanted to talk to you. They most likely liked you and wanted to ask you out. I remember the cops saying. I explained the guy trying the handles on my car. They wanted to play a prank, the officer said. We can't arrest pranksters. They said security checked the cameras and they weren't there anymore, then told me to just go home. I had to walk back to my car, completely alone and feeling humiliated.
to add, I ended up working the security there years later, but there were no cameras where I was. It was a blind spot. So the officers told me to walk back to my car because the cameras show they weren't there anymore, which was a lie. What do you think their motive was? This happened when I was 18 years old. I was big into running back then. I lived in a town that was a suburb, but had big swaths of farmland, as in smallish tomato and strawberry fields, not huge, never-ending wheat fields. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields because it was a lot easier on my legs than as opposed to running long distances on concrete or asphalt, and I was usually training for half marathons. 13.1 miles for those who aren't insane enough to think running is fun. This particular day, I was planning to run an easy 6 miles. I told my mom and she suggested I do a loop and meet them at the dog park, about 3 miles from our house as my halfway point. This is pre-cell phone era by the way, when all the craziest stuff went down. But being careful, I took a walkie-talkie my dad always used and my mom took the other one. Now, the walkie-talkie had a range longer than the ones my brothers and I played around with when we were younger, but it definitely did not work three miles away and I honestly had no idea what its exact range was. So, I take off on my run. I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a little bit until I get to the fields. I think it was lettuce or something then, but short small plants. I'm running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I have to run south and then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to the dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt part, my parents drive by, and being dorks, they honk and wave and yell at me. I wave and then soon after make my turn onto the smaller dirt road. This one road is flat dirt, but there is a small drainage ditch, a lettuce field, and then a wall that is the backyard of some houses. I start noticing how quiet the street is and how few cars are passing me. Then, I randomly start thinking to myself, if somebody tried to do something, I could run to those houses. But no, they're so far away, I would never make it. But then I hear a car. This one doesn't pass me like all the others. I hear it slow down so that it is behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go super alert, and I immediately realize what a dumbass I was to pick this route, because I'm stuck out here with nobody to help me, and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding up enough so that it's next to me, and I glance over to see a man. He's middle aged white, dark hair. Totally normal looking, but I get a chill go down my spine immediately. He sort of leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I am scared and I realize that this is not good. Now, admittedly, nothing has actually happened yet, and he could totally be innocent and just wanting to chat with me, but my intuition is in overdrive telling me I'm not safe. So I hop over the ditch, thinking at least that will make it harder for his car to follow me. That is of course if I need to take off across the field to try and make it to those houses in the distance. This pisses him off. He guns it and gets closer to the ditch and in front of where I am, and then he says in a voice I can only describe as bone-chillingly evil, You know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you out here, and no one would ever know where to find you. He has put his car in park and is taking off his seatbelt when I remember the walkie-talkie. The piece of crap is all static because I'm too far away. So I immediately turn down the volume and say loudly, Hey dad. Yeah. Yeah, I see your car. I'm over here by this red Buick. Do you see me? Fake wave to no one. There was no car coming from the direction my parents were and when I had started talking, there was no one behind us either, but by the grace of the universe at that exact moment, a car turned onto that road. The guy saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast that he left skid marks on the ground. 
I have never run faster in my entire life, and I was looking behind me every few seconds and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. I was shaking, and I was so scared and relieved when I got to that damn dog park. I told my parents everything that happened, and my mom called the cops. They took a statement, but said it would just help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out. I was so upset, and before I gave a description of the car, the cop asked, Was it a red Buick? He wouldn't tell us why. But that just added to my feeling that I had narrowly escaped something completely awful. This happened when I was five years old and my best friend was six years old. A quick school layout. The building was L-shaped. The short end was not in use at the moment and cars could stop to the right of the L in full view or behind the short part mostly obscured. The road was pretty much in a square around this school, but only in the aforementioned places that cars could pull over. We were at school one day and she did something that made me very angry. She grabbed my colorful pens without asking me, and I wanted revenge. So shortly afterwards, recess had started, and about halfway through, I saw my best friend walking towards the back of the short building and so I followed her thinking that she was going to do something fun. When I rounded the corner, I saw a man in a car giving her candy through the open passenger door. Well, trying to, my childish mind thought, why doesn't that guy just step out to give the candy? Now he's holding it just outside her reach and she has to climb the car to grab it, and his seat will get all dirty. My friend had one knee on the car seat, reaching for the candy now. I suddenly realized that this was a perfect time for my revenge. I would stop her from getting candy from this man. So I yelled at her that she wasn't allowed to be this close to the road. We would get in heaps of trouble if caught near the road instead of on the playground and I was going to tell on her. This caused her to jolt back and she ran away from the car and back to the school ground taunting me with the fact that a passerby thought that she was so pretty that he wanted to give her candy, but not me. Apparently, a teacher saw me walk towards the road and was on her way to fetch me, so she was just around the corner from us when my friend started taunting me. She heard what she said and quickly ran the last few steps towards us, frantically asking us, Did anyone get in a car? Did you see any classmates getting into a car? She was clearly panicking and the car was long gone by now, having driven off when I yelled at my friend. No, the nice man just wanted to give me candy and, insert my name here, said that she was going to tell on me so we ran back. I really wanted that candy. Are we in trouble now? The teacher escorted us inside, had all the other teachers count heads, everyone was there, and talked to the police that were called. And neither me nor my friend knew what was wrong at the time, until her parents came to fetch her and gave her a stern talking to about accepting candy from strangers, saying things like, We've talked about this, and we have plenty of candy back at home. My mom was proud of me because she thought I listened to the stranger danger talks and protected my friend, and I didn't correct her. A few years ago, my best friend and I were talking about our school and this day came up. We both just realized that if I hadn't been so obsessed with those pens, or if she had asked before taking them, that she could have been kidnapped and suffered a pretty bad fate. She couldn't believe how stupid she was for thinking that a random guy would really offer candy to kids from his car, especially since her parents had warned her about strangers before. I just felt embarrassed for not recognizing the situation from the talks my parents gave me and being so focused on getting revenge. It took me a while longer to fully realize that what could have happened to her would have been terrible. I don't know if the guy was ever arrested or did anything else. And after this incident, my school started permanently posting a teacher as lookout near the road. 
As far as I know, there were no more incidents at that school, and it was never really spoken of again. The official reason for the lookout teacher was to prevent students from running out onto the road and getting run over. When I drove past last year, they had put a fence all around the school. I'm guessing it's because they finally realized a fence is cheaper than paying a teacher an hour a day just to stand around. To the guy who probably tried to kidnap my best friend in broad daylight, let's never meet again. I was visiting my friend in Budapest that was working at a hostel. We ended up going out and drinking pretty heavily and meeting these two girls. We hung out with them through the night and offered to walk them back to their place. When we got there, my friend who had a girl on lock was like, Ah, I'll come back with you, Andrew. I just kept being like, Dude, you've got a girl that wants you to come up to her place. It's a short walk from here to get home. Just stay. He kept saying no and I jokingly was like, Well, you can't leave me if you can't find me and started running away. I'm a pretty stupid drunk, but it was funny at the time. Anyway, I run for a few minutes and quickly lost my bearings, had an empty wallet, and no phone. I just thought, ah, I'll wander, spot a landmark and find my way home from there. He'll sleep on the street. I was walking for 30 minutes at this point, really, really drunk. A car pulled up and a guy yelled at me in Hungarian. I just replied, sorry man, English only, and left. He was parked and I was chilling so we talked for a few minutes. He seemed alright and was like, dude, I can take you back to your hostel. I said yes and I went to hop in the back, and there were two guys back there I couldn't really see through the tinted windows. These guys were both super tatted up and very thug looking. I was too drunk to run if they were going to rob me. So I put on a brave face and got in. I was sobering up really fast. They start driving and I immediately realize that something is going on. Basically, Budapest was two separate cities on either side of the river. Buda and Pest. We were on Pest side, with most of the clubs and such, and we almost immediately crossed over, and I knew I didn't live on that side. So anyway, I was basically like, Hey man, my hostel is in Pest. Why are we going into Buddha? And they all just laugh and go quiet again. Finally, the driver pipes up and says, Man, no one knows where you went tonight. What would you do if we try to beat you up? And they're all laughing. I check my door handle, but unfortunately, it had a child lock. I kind of feign being sick and roll down my window as I slightly leaned out. The whole time they're talking, saying they could kill me and nobody would even know, that I didn't even know where I was. I just remember looking at my feet and being like, if you guys try anything tonight, I know you'll hurt me, or maybe kill me, but I promise I will kill one of you with me, I swear it on my life, I will make it happen. And they will laugh. We keep getting further out of the city, almost to the point of no buildings. We keep going back and forth with the threats when we hit a red light. Everyone in the car was kind of at ease since they thought I was too drunk to do anything. I leaned out the window, grabbed the handle from the outside, popped the door open, and fell backwards onto the pavement. Then I rolled and just started running. The car was stopped for a second, but I was shouting so they just peeled away. It was around 4 or 5 a.m., I find some guys playing Pokemon Go. This was during its peak time, so there were a lot of people out playing, thank god. They look terrified that this bleeding drunk guy is approaching them, but I explain my situation and they're super sympathetic. They call me a cab. I take the cab back to the hostel. All I had was 20 Canadian in my wallet and I beg the driver to take it. He does. I get to my room as the sun rises. My friend asked what happened. Apparently I just said, I got kidnapped. Sleep. I'll tell you tomorrow. And I passed out. In my bed. I grew up in a small beach town on the east coast. It had that cliche suburbia vibe. 
complete with book clubs and block parties. My sister and I were close friends with our neighbors as well, as they had a daughter, Kristen, around our age. A lot of time was spent playing together in our shared yards, at the beach down the street, and our nearby park. It had been one summer day that my mom and Kristen's mom decided to take us to this particular park, and as per usual, as soon as we arrived, Kristen, my sister, and I raced to the swing set to claim our seats. Our moms had followed leisurely behind us, looking ahead to see if they could snag a spot in the shade once they picked a picnic table. They then sat down and set up. They chatted and got some snacks ready for us, occasionally glancing over to make sure we hadn't fallen off the swings. The afternoon was going well. Everyone was having fun and enjoying the weather. When Kristen's mom pointed across to where we were playing, there, instead of just three kids swinging, there were four. Seems like the girls made a friend. She smiled at my mom as they looked at the other little girl who had joined us. An older woman, possibly her mother, was standing off to the side as well. My mom nodded, thinking nothing of it. It was completely normal for kids to make friends at the park, and especially in an area so friendly. Besides, she found it likely that older woman was with her and would be able to help if anything happened. They proceeded to talk for a little bit longer before my mom thought to look over again to check up on us. When she glanced over to the swings, she saw Kristen, she saw my sister, but she no longer saw me. She stared for one more second as it sunk in, and she realized the older woman was also not there. Panic washed over her, and she immediately alerted Kristen's mom as they rushed over, hoping I was just hiding behind the slide. My mom's eyes scanned over the playground, frantically trying to find me. She recalls Kristen's mom taking the other two girls by the hand, attempting to ask them what had happened, but before either of them were able to offer any sort of information, her eyes locked on mine. The older woman had taken me by the hand and was leading me off of the playground, out of the gate, and into the parking lot. My mom began to run after her, not explaining a word whatsoever, just yelling for her to stop. The woman did not pause, did not even turn around to acknowledge my mom's screams, until she was close enough to reach out and grab my one free hand. My mom immediately began to curse and question just what the hell she was doing with me. The older woman began to explain how this was just a misunderstanding, that she was only just walking me to the baseball field that was right across the street. Of course, this answer was completely unacceptable. And my mom was making this very clear, as Kristen's mom was quickly behind catching up, coming to aid in whatever way she could. It appeared that when the older woman noticed Kristen's mom was there as a backup, she let go of my hand and began to offer some semblance of an apology before hurrying to her car and quickly pulling away. And it was not until after she had already gotten down the street that my mom understood two suspicious details which are the following. Number one, the direction the older woman was walking me was toward her parked car and not at all the baseball field. And number two, the older woman did not put a child in the car before she left, meaning she came to a playground of kids all by herself. I often ask my mom why she didn't call the police at this moment, and honestly, she doesn't have a good answer. She tells me that she was just shocked, and I'm sure part of it was, but I also think it could have been partially due to embarrassment. However, I hope it's not like that at all. There was no way she could have expected this to happen to me, and she may have very well have saved my life at that moment. This is something I try to tell her. While I'm into my 20s now, and this happened when I was a toddler, I still think about it from time to time at least this recounted version that my mom tells me, and it's a scary idea to think that she wouldn't have seen me in time, and that I could have had a completely different path in my life. I hope this woman never actually got the chance to take any kids who didn't know her into her car, and if she's still out there, 
let's never meet. This is a long story, but I need to get it out. I work at a higher end women's clothing store in my state's largest mall. We're also seriously understaffed and generally only have one manager and one associate on at all times. This is important later. This incident happened two weeks after I was promoted to manager. It was my first night closing the store as a manager on duty and I was already a little bit nervous even though I had weeks of training. A few hours into my shift, my store manager asked me to hang a banner in the front window to promote a sale. I asked my associate, Allie, to help me because the sign is heavy and hard to put up. It takes about 20 minutes of struggling to get the damn thing up, but we did it. As I'm cleaning up the supplies I needed for it, I lock eyes with a man outside the store. The man is sitting on the bench in the middle of the corridor my store is in, talking on his phone. No big deal. People are always out there. He's probably waiting for someone. Our store is in between a popular bra store and a well-known coffee chain. Easy landmarks for people unfamiliar with our mall. I gave him a quick smile and I continued on my way. An hour later, Allie comes up to me and tells me that the same man was still sitting on the bench outside on his phone and that immediately rose some alarm bells. The MOD is always supposed to be near the front of the store, but being so understaffed, managers are often running back and forth from the front to the back where the registers are located. I happened to be helping ring someone out when she told me this. In the last few months, we had a few people grab piles of clothes off the table at the front of the store and run out. So I casually walked to the front to fold some sweaters and to keep an eye on this man. That's when things took a turn for the strange. As I get close to the door, I hear the man say to his phone, I'm sure I can get one, but I might be able to get two. Whispers, one's coming now. Bye. My mind is still thinking the guy is going to grab and run once I have my back turned. Instead, he jumps up, walks just outside the doors, and gives me the biggest, sweetest smile. Excuse me, miss, come here for a second. I want to show you something. Come out here with me, just for a minute. Me now getting super creepy vibes from this guy. Uh, I'm sorry sir, I'm the manager on duty and I can't leave this store whatsoever. And I back up a few feet. Oh, shoot, I just wanted to show you how wonderful your sign looks. I saw you ladies struggling to put it up earlier. I wanted to offer my help, but I knew it was probably against the rules. Now I understand being friendly, but this guy was being overly friendly, as if trying to charm me. Oh, haha, <laughs> thank you. Those signs are heavy, and they can be a pain to put up. Oh, I bet. And he walks into the store. I give him a weak smile and back up towards the middle of the store to straighten things up. Meanwhile, also keeping an eye on him. I look for my co-worker and she's now disappeared into the back room. So much for power in numbers. He starts wandering around, looking at different items, checking the tags, clearly pretending to be browsing. As he gets towards the back of the store, my store manager, a gruff woman, much larger than my 5 foot 4, 120 pound self, comes out of the back of the room. She starts talking about schedules and meetings. So she's clearly the one in charge of the whole store. He sees her and makes his way towards the exit. I'm still at the front, but I've wedged myself between a table and two mannequins. You're doing a great job here, the guy says. You lovely ladies have a wonderful evening. He tips his hat and leaves. My store manager is on her way to the doors when I jump in front of her and explain everything. I've seen just about every single side of her, but I've never seen her look as concerned and startled as she looked when I told her. But being the no-nonsense type of person that she is, she tells me that she'll go ask him why he's trying to get her employees out of the store. She walks out the door, looks towards the direction he walked away in, and comes back to tell me he's now standing in a spot that I wouldn't be able to see him unless I walked out of the store. 
Unfortunately, she could not stay with us because she had an appointment but told us to call security if we saw him again. As luck would have it, 30 seconds later, two security guards are about to pass my store. I wave them down and explain everything. They're clearly concerned as well, especially since there's been reports of people trying to lure young women out of the mall. They start walking towards the direction he was in so that they could have a chat with him. Five minutes later, one security guard comes back to me and asks me if the man sitting further down the corridor is the same man. It was. He wasn't too close, but still close enough to come back when he had the chance. At this point, I'm about to have a panic attack and I'm almost going to start crying. The guard says he'll stay close of a distance from my store for the rest of the night. Luckily, the man didn't come back. I think security made him leave, but I'm not totally sure. I called my husband and had him walk Allie and me to our cars. As I recounted the story to my husband, I ended up realizing something. The man was wearing a zip-up sweatshirt with large pockets, which he had his hands in the whole time that this transpired. I firmly believe if I walked out of the store, he would have pulled a concealed weapon or something to get me to leave the mall quietly. Deep down, I know if I was stupid enough to walk out, I never would have walked back in again. So, man that tried to lure me out of the store and try to kidnap me, let's never, ever meet again. I just like to start off by saying that I'm not the greatest at writing, so I'm going to give this my best shot. I'm sorry if there are many mistakes. My high school held an annual Euro tour and I went on my first one in 2011 when I was 16 years old. There would be a bunch of teachers and parents that came along to supervise, including our headmaster, and almost everything was scheduled, but we did get a few hours every day to explore the cities ourselves. The tour was 12 days long. This would be my first experience on a plane, so my first experience overseas as well. My friend and I were casually walking the streets of Rome, not far from our hotel, taking pictures and whatnot, wasting time before we had to meet our entire group of around 15 kids and 4 teachers so we can get pizza at a small restaurant, also very close to our hotel. This comes into play with what happened later at the restaurant. Fast forward, we are at this restaurant now, all sitting on the sidewalk, eating pizza, and chatting. The teachers were sitting inside the restaurant right near the door to keep an eye on what was happening outside. I decided to go next to the door to buy myself a bottle of water. Now I didn't think to take anyone with me as the tiny corner store was so close to the pizza place and there were a few kids that were sitting near the entrance. After leaving the store, I got pushed up against a light post by a large man in a dark jacket. He towered over me opened his jacket to cover me, and asked for my name. I was in so much shock, I couldn't even respond in that moment, so he asked me again, and I refused to tell him. Luckily, one of the girls saw this happening, ran over, and grabbed me out of this man's reach. I immediately burst out crying, and we alerted the teachers. Our headmaster, thinking he may have just been a drunk, shouted at him to leave and the man disappeared around the corner. All was well. Things calmed down. I was now standing against the wall with six people in front of me, closer to the entrance. This same man then pops out of what seems like nowhere and tries to break through the people in front of me so he can try to grab me again. This causes a huge havoc with everyone around us, and now all the adults are on high alert and getting involved, trying to chase this man away only to see him run a little bit further down the road and hop into a white car and drive off. We got the entire group together again and were escorted back to the hotel, very confused by the situation. Later that evening, we got our free time where we got to pick our own restaurant in the area to go with our group of friends. We were normally in groups of five. We dressed up, walked down the streets until we found a restaurant we liked, 
Though the earlier incident had lost its worry with all the excitement and activities that were going on, and we were heavily distracted. We then all, the whole tour group, minus adults, decided to meet up at a bar since Euro tours can't be complete without the older group trying to act a little naughty, slipping in a few irresponsible drinks before a curfew. As I got to the entrance, I was pulled inside by two of the people on my tour and told to sit down. Apparently someone spotted the same man from earlier on in the day in the same white car, sitting parked a little further down the dark road. This time, he was with another man. I broke down and we were all terrified. We explained what was going on to the owners as best as we could and decided to head out back to the hotel as a group constantly checking around us and keeping count of every person. Luckily, we were leaving for a different town not many hours away very early the next morning, and this experience still haunts me. I don't know where this man first saw me, or what his intentions were. He may have been following me the whole day, through the night, knowing exactly what hotel I was staying in and everything. Being from South Africa, Europe was another world to me and we had this idea that everything was safe and free compared to our country. Now looking back, I wish I didn't let my guard down so far. On another note, Italy is incredible, and that pizza was the bomb. All growing up, my dad was a semi-truck driver. He drove full time all over the country. We didn't get to see him very often but he used to call home almost every night, and in the summers. My sisters and I got to travel with him for a week or two. We called it trucking. This story happened when I was very little, probably four or so, and I don't really remember it. I was trucking with my dad, and he was experiencing some minor engine trouble. Before he was a truck driver, my dad was a mechanic and did most of his own truck repairs. He had pulled over in a small truck stop to work on the truck. There was a tree next to the parking lot, so he sat me down underneath it with my doll, and he worked on the truck right next to me. It was really hot, and he was laying underneath a hot truck, and blacked out. Who knows how long he was out for. He was having a heat stroke, though, but he finally came to with a splitting headache. He looked over to the tree to check up on me and I was still just sitting there playing with my doll, but there was a guy creeping up behind me, reaching out to grab me. I don't know how, but with the little energy my dad had left, he jumped out from under the truck yelling and swinging whatever tool he had nearby. The guy ran off, and my dad collapsed. A lady working inside the truck stop saw the whole thing, and came running out. She got me and my dad inside, and took care of me while he cooled down. I don't know what would have happened if my dad hadn't woken up when he did. But regardless, creepy truck stop dude, let's never meet. When I was 14, I lived in Washington State. I still live in the same town this happened in. At the time, I was with my ex-girlfriend, and she was going to pick me up for dinner. I wanted to look nice for the date, and at the time I wasn't living with my parents and had very little clothes or money. So I called my good friend's little sister and asked her if I could borrow a pair of leggings I had seen her wear. She said fine and I would just need to walk over to her house. Now, this is important. The walk was only five minutes from who I was staying with at the time, but that's no big deal. However, her road has a very large dip in it, like a reverse hill if you will. When you are in the middle of the road, you really can't see the other side because of how deep the dip in the road is. Also, right in that spot there is no sidewalk, so you have to kind of hope and pray there isn't a car. Well, I walked to her house, got the leggings, and everything was fine. Then, when I was walking back, right when I was in the dip of the road, in my peripheral vision, I saw something slow down beside me. This all happened in seconds. I noticed the van slowing down beside me and then stopped right in front of me, so the only way to pass was to walk around the van. I stopped, and my heart literally went into my throat. 
I had a bad feeling the moment he slowed down, but now it was confirmed that there was no way I was going to walk past that van. I froze, holding my fists up for some reason, I guess ready to fight in my first instinct, and I saw him. Well, part of him, through the back window of the van. He was overweight, gray hair, and had a big nose. That was all I could see. He opened the slider side of the van like waiting for me to pass so he could snatch me. I was still frozen, pretty much waiting for him to get out of the car, and I was preparing to start screaming. And this is when a truck came down the road with a man and his wife. They stopped, and the van drove away so fast. The tires screeched, and he didn't even close the door. And the nice couple said that they had a daughter only a year older than I was at the time. And they watched the scene and also got a bad feeling about it. They gave me a ride home. If the couple ever sees this, I think you saved my life. And I know I was speechless in the car, but thank you. And blue van creepy guy, let's not meet again. I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age. My family and I lived out of town, about 8 miles out, and our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off two blocks away from my home. One day, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me, so slow that I figured that they were just looking for a house or something else. I ignored it and walked to my house. That was the end of that. Consistently though, this truck would follow me slowly. After a couple of days of this, I walked into my house. I was always the first one home, and I looked out the window. Inside was an older man in a black lab. He was staring at me, idling inside his truck. Then he pulled away. I decided that enough was enough. I ended up telling my parents. Of course, my sister was quick to jump in that I was lying. I had a habit of telling stories. But my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, across the street at the gas station, pointing toward the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the following scene. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat just staring at the bus. His license plate was caked in mud so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much that she called the police and the school, and I went to school, and was quickly pulled inside the office. The man had been spotted at the school, waiting inside his truck. That day, I rode the bus home. This time, however, the truck was parked alongside the street. I would have to walk past this man's driver's side door to get home. I had debated, considering running for it. But apparently this man was getting desperate now that he was spotted. A police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man. He then quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. We never did see him again. And I don't believe he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days and children go missing so easily. To be honest with all of you, I don't like to think about if I had been grabbed, because chances are I wouldn't even be here typing this, and my kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky, but many children aren't. When I was in middle school, I would take the bus home. The bus stop is two blocks away from my house, I lived up the block from a funeral home and would cut through the parking lot to shave 30 seconds off my walking time. The first block was flat and on a main road. The second block, after the funeral home, was a hill and a residential road. Some days I would end up on the same bus as some other kids on my block, but sometimes not. On this day I took a later bus so I got to walk those two blocks alone. I had my headphones on and was listening to the angsty music typical for a 12 year old in 2007. As I'm halfway through the funeral home parking lot, I noticed a car pull out of a parking spot and head near me. 
It was one of those boxy older cars that some people refer to as the land yachts. I move closer to the fence on the right so the car can drive past me. By the time the car gets to me, I'm in an alley behind the funeral home. They don't drive past. The driver rolls down the passenger side window and asks if I know how to get to a certain intersection. I tell the driver how to get there as I continue to walk so that I'm in an area where people can see me. Oh, I'm not very good at remembering directions. Can you show me how to get there? No. Well, I have a map in the glove box. Can you draw the way on the map? No. I'm not getting in your car. I pull my phone out to call my mother, and the driver speeds off. Even with the driver gone, however, I call my mom and tell her what happened as I walk the last block home. I stopped cutting through the parking lot after that. Three weeks later, as I'm just passing the funeral home, the same car and driver pulls up next to me. My phone had died at school since I forgot to charge it the night before. Hey, how old are you? Have you ever considered modeling? You're so pretty. I'm 12. Please leave me alone. I have a friend who has a modeling agency. I can pass along your information to them. No. Leave me alone. Oh, come on, don't be like that. I just want to help you get famous, baby. I have been walking up the hill this entire time. We are quickly approaching my house, but I don't want them to know where I live. Please, leave me alone. I'm not interested. Look, all you gotta do is give me your email address, or even a phone number. Your pictures will be on all the magazines. We are in front of my house. I keep walking. The driver is still driving slowly next to me. You sure got a long way to walk. Why don't I give you a ride? You must be tired. I stop responding to them and I keep on walking. They keep trying to convince me to get inside their car. However, I pulled out my phone even though it's dead and I pretend to call my mom. The car now instantly speeds off again. I keep walking in the neighborhood for about 10 more minutes. I see the car four more times but I'm still pretending to be on the phone, so they never approach me. I've been walking in circles the entire time, and after not seeing the car for 10 more minutes, I take the long way back home. I call my mom from the landline and I tell her everything. She has me call the police. As per usual in my city, no officer ever shows up. So, after that, I changed the route I walked home after that, even though it took 10 minutes longer. I never saw the car again. It has been more than a decade, and I still have all of these what-ifs in my head. What if I didn't have a cell phone? What if the driver wasn't alone? What if I had just knocked on a neighbor's door? What if by not getting me in their car, they got someone else? What if I had called the police instead of my mom that first time? Dear man in the old car, Let's not meet again. So this happened about 13 years ago. I was 10 at the time. My brother was 8. We had just moved to a new town that year and the Walmart here had this sweet arcade up near the service desk. So every time my parents would bring us grocery shopping, they would give us each a few dollars and let us play in the arcade. The town had an incredibly low crime rate, and the arcade is at the front of the store, where dozens of people are checking out. So, what could possibly go wrong? My brother is playing the claw machine while I'm standing on the side of the machine, trying to help him angle the claw perfectly above a stuffed animal that he's trying to get. Suddenly, this random hillbilly walks up to the claw machine next to us, inserts a quarter, and begins moving the claw around, but for most of this time, he's making eye contact with my brother and smiling, not even watching the game. He's not talking to us, just staring and smiling. He has long, thin brown and silver hair, pulled back in a loose ponytail at the base of his skull, a camo trucker hat, and a long scraggly beard. I remember vividly the way he smelled, still beer ashtray, and something that smelled like a sweet, yet sour dirt or fungus. He tries making small talk with my brother and I, who were raised to be aware of strangers, but still, 
to be polite. Eventually we get bored of the game we're playing and I usher my brother to follow me to a new game on the opposite side of the arcade. A few seconds later, the man follows us, stationing himself once again at the claw machine next to us. At some point, an overweight lady walks in and says to the hillbilly, What are you doing to these little kids? and snickers at me. He replies, I'm trying to win them some stuffed animals. She then begins playing the claw on the other side of us, so that my brother and I are sandwiched between these two strange hillbillies. His comment comes across as weird to me, because previously I thought he was maybe trying to win something for his kids, but this entire time, he had just been following my brother and I from game to game, trying to win his toys. This had been going on for maybe 20 minutes at this point. They followed us to several different machines, and spent a lot of money. The games were all 25 cents per play. Each time my brother and I switched machines, they would follow us. The hillbilly says to the lady, I'm out of money. You got any? She says, Nah, I'm broke too. My brother says, I have a dollar still. Now this is the part that really scared me. I remember listening to these two talk about some weird things with us, asking if I have a boyfriend, asking where we go to school, where our parents work, asking if we've ever done drugs, etc. But when my brother said he had a dollar, she responded with the most terrifying thing I had heard from them yet. The woman suddenly bursts out. Well then, give it to him, boy. Her face was red. The tone in which she shouted was so ear-piercing that I could feel the blood drain from my face. My brother looked like he was about to cry. He hands her the dollar and her face lights up. She laughs it off, almost like she's trying to make it seem like she was joking when she yelled at us. My father walks up a couple of minutes later. As I turn to tell him that these people have spent close to $15 to win toys for us, they leave in a hurry before he gets a good look at them. My dad was livid. He takes us to the front desk and tells them what I told him. They make an announcement on the intercom to keep an eye out for these people and to report to an employee if they see them. Then they call the police. I don't actually remember this part or much of anything after my father arrives, but this is what he told me. They never did find the couple. The police reviewed security cameras too blurry to make out any physical details, and told my parents that the couple left the store immediately after my father showed up, without any groceries. Every time I see a man or woman in Walmart that looks as I remember them, I get anxiety and try to avoid them. So, to the hillbilly couple lurking in Walmart, I hope I never, ever meet you again. Edit I forgot to mention that the two seem to be in their mid-fifties, from what I remember. I believe that they were a couple, but I don't know for sure. I don't think she was his mother though. It seems that some people thought that they were a mother and son based on the way I explained it. So I apologize for that. When I was 17 years old. I worked inside a large mall at Vans. I had a lot of creepy older guys come in and flirt with me, but one guy took the cake. One day I was working in the usual busy as hell Saturday nights, and there were four very tall men that asked for my help getting shoes. I worked at an outlet so the store was large with tall racks. The mall I worked in was extremely popular amongst the locals and tourists alike. The mall has some history with being a sex trafficking hotspot for context. So anyway, the men said that they were from Nigeria and they were pretty chill at first until they began to flirt. One man kept saying that he has a son in Nigeria and asked if I wanted to wed him. I laughed because I thought he was joking, but suddenly he looked extremely offended. I was awkward and began talking about the shoes, but the man interrupted me with saying how great his son was and that I would make a great wife. At that point, I grew uncomfortable because I didn't want to be rude, so I asked for a co-worker to come over to take care of them 
Meanwhile, I went to the bathroom. Everything was normal for the remainder of my shift. I clocked out and I was waiting for my dad to come pick me up. I usually walked around the halls of the mall as I waited. The music was soothing and all was calm. I walked past a restroom hall and saw figures standing in my peripheral vision. I glanced and saw that it was the four men from earlier. I was now in full-on panic mode, but I played it off. I smiled at them softly and kept walking so they didn't think I was being rude. Sure enough though, they began following me. I picked up my pace hoping to find other people walking around, but there was nobody else. I was now speed walking, but the guys were keeping pace with me. And my thoughts were to just go to the bathroom so I could lose them. So I entered the next restroom hall. I walked slowly thinking I had lost them, but soon after I heard pounding footsteps in a hurry. I looked back and saw that they were coming right for me. I didn't think the bathroom was an option anymore, and I started yelling for help. I ran straight for the employee corridors of the mall. Right when I got through the doors, a security guard met me on the other side. I bumped into him, and I never felt more relieved in my entire life. The men then took off the other way, and the guard let me stay in his office until my dad arrived. Thank God for the guard. If he wasn't there, I would probably wouldn't be writing this out right now. As for those guys, let's not meet. This happened a couple of months ago, but it still creeps me out. My daughter was born in January, and she was born at 33 weeks due to complications. She was only 2 pounds and it was required she stay in the NICU until she gained weight and was healthy enough to come home. Fast forward 8 and a half weeks and my husband and I find out she'll be home the next day and we needed to get a car seat for her car seat test. My husband had just been paid and we went and bought her one from Walmart on our way back to the hospital. On our way, he decided to stop at GameStop. He asked if I wanted to go in or stay in the car. I opted to stay outside and install the car seat base. He parked a ways away from the door and in between a beat up rusted pickup and beside a van that blocked any view of the door. There were two men that were working on that pickup truck. Now being raised by a police officer has made me into a person extremely aware of my surroundings at all times. Both of the men looked like they were backwoods country type men. Guy number one is a white male, and guy number two is African American. They both had on a hat, some dirty jeans, and plaid shirts. I got out of the car and pulled the car seat box out of the back seat and started opening it. At this point, my husband was already inside, and the two men had taken an interest in watching me. The white man comes to the front of our car and says, Hi. How are you today? I just glanced up and nodded. All my warning bells were now beginning to ring. I now had opened the trunk to put the empty box in and closed it and set the car seat on the back of the car and I was standing in the back passenger door putting the base in. I used my peripheral vision to see that the white man moved closer to me and the African American man had moved in front of my car. So I moved the tire iron closer to me and latched the base in and popped back up. At this point, the white male was closer to the car seat that was sitting on the trunk. He said, Oh, you got a little one with you. I said, Excuse me? He started reaching up to the car seat and stopped and said, Oh, I thought you had a baby with you. Now the African American man was by the passenger side front door and the white man was still on my side by the car seat. The African American man then walked quickly back to the truck and called the other guy over. He said, No, let's go. Her man is a cop. We need to go. I had forgotten until I heard that my husband was in his uniform. He's a level 3 security officer so he does carry a weapon with him and wears a vest. That's why he thought that. At that point, I had thrown the car seat into the car and went to the driver's side to grab the car keys and then go inside the GameStop. I was shaking and crying and told my husband what had just happened. My husband, as well as a GameStop employee, went outside but the men had now been gone and they were nowhere to be seen. 
The employee called the cops and I made a report. The officer said thankfully I had a license plate number and so chose to remove myself from the situation instead of talking to the men. In my area at that point, there had been three mothers and their babies who reported a similar situation with almost being kidnapped and one man who was shot and killed while his daughter was taken. It just plays over and over in my head. What if my daughter was in the car seat? What would they have tried? I guess that remains a mystery to this very day. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saldil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with these scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.